it might be computer related in a way. We'll have a Q and A at the end, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. And let me just ask right. people out there: Can you hear me? Is my voice muffled? A little muffled. Can you? Uh, <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah, I can you can. Oh, okay. Yeah. If we're all, you know, more than six feet, I think God can probably have us. Um. Yeah. I think I have us. We love the bit. I thought it was quicker. All right. So My glasses will get fogged up on that. <laughs> so the issue with this particular screen is it's tilted. It's like that part of the wall is like more towards the back than this part. So when you're working with a flat screen, it like it will always appear to be like smaller towards one end and larger towards the other. That is struggling with that before. Gosh, that's that's annoying. Well, the webinar participants don't see that. They'll see this. Yeah. Sure. They'll see that. They will hear whatever this microphone picks up, okay. which would be anything in a 10 feet radius. Okay. All right. Well, we're one minute away. Start the webinar. Oh. So uh, I, I missed the, where I should stand. I'm just going to do a short introduction. All right. Just stand right there. You'll be able to see yourself in the camera right okay. there. And I'll do a. Uh, I'll be able to push this on the webinar participants. All right. So. I have done audio tests with myself by just standing in remote corners of the room and clapping to make sure it goes through. Okay. But I actually don't know how someone who would actually be listening would hear. Ah. It would still hopefully be audible because I've had those cameras used in my classes and they okay. seem to work fine. Great. Oh, we'll do this again. Okay, so this is going to pick up the sound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fix up everything in a 10 feet radius. Okay. Great. You might actually pick up some of the audience. Oh, nice. So no cursing out there. <laughs> <laughs> We'll hear my clicks every time I change the slide because this trackpad is very, you have to click it really hard and it totally screw that up. So I'll just use my mouse. Got a handful of people out there on Zoom, so welcome. We're, we're just going to wait another minute or two for our in person audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll get started. You, were there Simon's Rock time when you were here? Simon's Rock. Time. So everybody comes to things five minutes late and they uh, call it Simon's no, Rock time? No. 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 <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> what a nice. Well, you all are on time, so good for you. Like there is a, uh, my grandson, he says something. He, he goes up in his room and he goes out or whatever. He said, Come on down to dinner. I'll be there in a second. So I'll be there in a minute. So it would be like half an hour later. Uh -huh. So we got to uh, uh, call in any minutes to lay anybody's right now. So we're using the Liam second or the Liam minute. Oh, the Liam, which is really five or 10 minutes. Which means also, you know, a minute, which would be about an hour. Another hour. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Well, let's see. I think we can get started if sure. that's okay with you. So welcome, thanks to you all for being here. Um, this is our first event in this Think Food Conference of 2021. I'm glad to have it in person and virtual. Welcome to all of those of you on Zoom. And this is our preview event. So we have uh, the rest of the conference will be tomorrow and we have events that you probably all signed up for um, from 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. So I hope to see you at some of those. 
But this preview event is really important to me because we've been wanting to have our speaker, Ron Kajowski, here at, at the Think Food Conference for a while, and he's very busy and he usually can't make it, so we're happy to have him. And I want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he has a BS and MS and a PhD in biological sciences from SUNY Albany, and he actually was here at Simon's Rock until 1977, is that right? And founded the Environmental Studies Program, which I didn't know until recently, so we're glad to have him back. I know. Uh, and he, so we taught here for quite a while and, and then sort of drifted off to UMass and he's been working at the um, extension program at University of Massachusetts, UMass Extension as a horticultural consultant, writer and lecturer. He also has a massive vegetable garden that he tends to when he doesn't have those sorts of events to attend to. Um, so we welcome Ron, Ron Kajowski, thank you for being here. And he's going to let us know about composting, teach us about composting, and I'll let you take it away. Thank okay. you for being here. Thank you very much, Mary Ann. Yeah, it's been a while since <laughs> I've been here. But uh, um, welcome everyone and um, uh, all the gardeners. I assume everybody that's listening in and is here and is interested in gardening. But it's interesting, just uh, recently I uh, read a statistic uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency that said something like, one third of our food products uh, are wasted and they're just discarded. And, uh, you know, so I think something like compost is, is a very appropriate thing, especially for somebody uh, who is into gardening or uh, even farmers, of course, too. So uh, that was one of the, the things that uh, made me realize that we really need to talk more about composting. So let's talk about composting and how we can turn that compost into garden gold. So what is composting? Well, uh, first of all, compost happens, to put it very simply, and because it's going on in nature all the time. Yeah, you go out in the woods and yeah, there's composting going on. It's simply the breakdown of organic matter. So let's take a look at the next slide here. So it's organic matter, which is in the presence of microbes and insects in the soil that are going to in the environment that are going to break down this organic matter. Now, it requires the presence of oxygen for this to happen because these are aerobic organisms, meaning that they need oxygen in order to work. So they require oxygen. They also have to be have a moist environment. So when it's really dry out there, you don't get that kind of decomposition in nature that you would uh, unless it's moist. And as byproducts of that, carbon dioxide is given off. And that's carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere that plants then are going to use in photosynthesis to build organic matter again. And there is heat given off in that uh, process. So if you just happen to go out into the woods, have a thermometer in the soil, uh, you would see that near the surface there would be a higher temperature than it would uh, deeper in the soil. And of course, there are a lot of minerals that are tied up in organic matter. And so by breaking down that organic matter, uh, that releases these minerals. These minerals then function as nutrients for further plant growth. And of course, we can take advantage of this whole process in our garden endeavors. Next slide. Okay. And then uh, uh, as I mentioned there just very quickly, the gums. That's basically the sticky stuff that helps glue together soil particles. So, you know, if you have a soil, for example, it has a lot of clay, very fine particles in it. The gums or sticky stuff that is a byproduct of, uh, of composting or breakdown of organic matter helps to glue together those soil particles. It is very important for anybody that has a very uh, sandy soil, or excuse me, a very clay soil. Uh, that helps break up the, uh, or glue together those particles so you get better drainage and better aeration. So, what do we need in order to manage this process of composting? Well, first of all, you need the raw materials. And uh, you also will take a look at that. You also look at the ratio in which you mix these materials. And we simply refer to that as the carbon nitrogen ratio. And we mentioned uh, what that means. You need moisture, of course. You need air, oxygen. And uh, you need a certain amount of temperature for, for the process to take place. And actually, a lot of that temperature is generated by the process itself. Next slide. So what do you need? Well, we classify the materials that you need into two categories, uh, brown materials and green materials. So what do we mean by brown materials? Well, brown materials are the bulky materials. This is the, the, the bulk of, 
of which are going to be breaking down. These materials are low in nitrogen, so they're basically carbon materials, a lot of cellulose, a lot of lignin in cell walls and these materials. They don't have much moisture. Think of something like wood chips. Think of leaves that people are going to be raking up on their lawn soon. There's not a lot of moisture in there because it's all dry up material. And, but they have high porosity, meaning that uh, these materials, when you put them into a compost pile, because of the bulkiness of them, there's going to be a lot of pore spaces uh, in the compost, uh, um, compost process. So what are some of these raw materials? Well, as I mentioned, leaves, for example. People are going to be breaking leaves off of their lawns. If they run over these leaves with their lawnmower, they can chop this stuff up. And this is an ideal substrate for composting. Wood chips as well. Uh, I get my wood chips. Uh, I have friends in what I did as a, as a career. I have a lot of friends who are arborists. And so I run into them and say, hey, can you bring me a load of wood chips? And of course, they're looking at Suppose of wood chips and they will drop off a load. But a lot of these uh, uh, same people also uh, will compost uh, these wood chips. So wood chips are good, also brown material. In addition to that, you have straw, you can have sawdust, and as you're cleaning up your garden now, you've got those corn stalks that are all dried up right now. You can pull those up, chop them up, and put it into the uh, compost pile. And it's important that you chop these materials up rather than putting them in whole. For example, you don't want to put in a log into a compost pile. You don't want to put in your, uh, a uh, unchopped up uh, corn stalks. Although you can, I'll show you a little bit later on how you can do that. Uh, okay, so those are the brown materials. Uh, then you also have, you need your green materials. The green materials are the energy source. They're gonna supply the energy uh, for the process. They are high in nitrogen, and they usually have a lot of moisture in them, but they're low porosity because if you just put in green materials into your compost pile, they'll get compact, uh, compacted. And as a result, there'll be no oxygen in the compost pile. And so you'll have anaerobic organisms working on the material. And as anaerobic uh, uh, organisms, they won't completely break down some of that material or in the process of breaking it down, they'll be giving off a lot of nitrogen in a form of ammonia. And this is why if you just take green materials and put them into a compost pile, after a while, it'll begin to stink. <laughs> Not something that you want, especially if you have neighbors nearby. Okay, so what are some of these green materials? As I said, they're high nitrogen materials. So grass clippers have a lot of nitrogen in them. They also have moisture in them. Uh, kitchen waste and uh, all these things, you know, your, your scrapings, your peels, your banana peels, stuff like this, coffee. Uh, coffee grounds, uh, tea bags, and it's, the coffee grounds too, you know, if you're making your own coffee and you have the coffee maker there, that paper filter that you use, that breaks down readily uh, as well. So uh, kitchen waste. Uh, then you have the manures, uh, cow manure, poultry manure, rabbit manure. I'm very fortunate in that I have a chicken factory down the road. Actually, my neighbor has a bunch of chickens, and uh, one of their byproducts of chickens, of course, is manure. And uh, so I, that's a source of, uh, of manure for my compost. What you don't want to put in the compost pile are things like meat, grease products like lard, uh, oils from cooking, fatty oils. And the reason for that is that these attract animals that uh, can create problems. So you want to avoid uh, those kinds of things. You want to avoid uh, manures from uh, pet animals like cats and dogs. And the reason for that is there's more of a chance of introducing disease organisms into the compost when you use these critters, uh, the manure from these critters. So you want, you want the manure from animals that are used to, where their primary food product uh, is vegetable matter, as opposed to meat matter that the cats and dogs are, are fed. So you want, carbon material and you want uh, nitrogen material. So you want uh, the greens, uh, the browns rather, the carbon source and the greens, which are the nitrogen source. Now the ratio of these materials is important. In order to get the compost to work properly, uh, you want to have a specific ratio of carbon atoms to nitrogen atoms. So what this says here, ideal is 
a ratio of 30 to 1. What that means is you want, for every single nitrogen atom, you want about 30 carbon atoms in the compost pile. So uh, if you have uh, a ratio that is much greater than 30 to 1, what happens is that the nitrogen gets used up for that the breakdown of that organic matter. The organisms that are in the soil are going to be taking all that excess nitrogen out and using it to break down uh, the, uh, the, the carbon products, the, uh, the, the brown products. And you know, if you have a lot of those brown products, it's going to use up all that nitrogen. And so there won't be nitrogen uh, available in the compost uh, process. So the, and that slows down the decay because the organisms that are breaking it down need that nitrogen. And if it's not there, that's because there's been not enough of it, break down all that uh, all that carbohydrate, then the decay process just slows down and it'll take a long, long time for the compost to be completely uh, finished. Now, if you have uh, too much nitrogen, if you put in too many green materials, what happens is that they deplete the oxygen because it's going to be working too fast. And they're going to be taking the oxygen out of the pore space in your compost pile. And that also will slow down the process. But in the meantime, it will also give off a lot of odors because uh, there'll be a lot of ammonia gas that will be given off. And uh, you know you're going to have uh, too much uh, nitrogen materials and not enough carbon materials if your compost pile starts to smell pretty foul. So uh, this is why we look for that ratio of about three, three to one. And what that means is roughly that you want to mix green and brown materials, about one part green material to about two parts uh, brown material. That'll give you that roughly that 30 to one ratio. Okay, okay. here's an example of, of the carbon to nitrogen ratios of different materials. Food scraps have a carbon nitrogen ratio of about 15 to 1. So what that tells you is there's a lot of nitrogen in that. Uh, grass looking, same thing. Uh, Rod and manures. So you see the ratio there uh, is less than 30 to 1, which tells us then that there's uh, a lot of nitrogen in those particular materials. Now, on the other hand, uh, you have corn stalks with a 60 to 1 ratio, leaves about 40 to 80 to 1 ratio, straw 80 to 1. Sawdust and butchers, 500 to 1. So you can't just put the browns into a compost pile and expect something to happen, expect these things to break down because the ratio is so far uh, askew. Okay. All right, now the next thing you need is moisture. Because the, the pile has to be moist because the organisms need that, that moisture in which uh, to work. So you need about the compost pile should consist of about 40 to 6 percent uh, moisture and water. And one way to find out if you have enough, you know, you're not going to go in there and kind of measure and figure out, you know, there's no calculation for determining how much moisture you actually have. But there's a very simple thing you can do. We call it a squeeze test. And uh, all you can, all you do is you pick up some of the, the compost material and squeeze it. And if it feels dry, you know, and it doesn't kind of fall apart, or rather it falls apart very easily, then there's not enough moisture in it. If you squeeze it and water drips out, then you've got too much moisture. And that's filling up all the pore spaces, and so it's going to be lower, low oxygen levels in the compost pile. But if you can squeeze it, it feels, it feels moist, uh, and doesn't feel dry, and there's no dripping of water, then you have roughly the amount of moisture that you, you need. It's like picking up soil in the springtime and you're trying to decide when can I plant, you know, because uh, after snows melt and the soils melt and you're looking to plant, the simple test is you just pick up the soil sample and you squeeze it. And if you release it, it falls apart. It means the soil is too dry. If you squeeze it, it drips out. It means your soil is saturated and you can't do anything with it. If you squeeze it and you poke it a little bit, it falls apart. It's ideal. So it's the same kind of uh, process here. So it's too, too, too dry, the decay just takes a very long time. And if it's too wet, you have an anaerobic condition and no oxygen. And so that will also slow down the process and cause a release of the uh, smelly substances. So to correct that, uh, what you want to do is, as, as I say, the squeeze test or just, just 
you look at the material and if it's in a very dry period, you just have to add some uh, some uh, moisture. If it's too wet, you dry, add the dry, you have to dry bulky materials. Uh, so these would be things like the wood chips, like the uh, chopped uh, leaves, something like that. Okay. All right. Now, uh, the next thing that you have to make sure is that there's plenty of air or oxygen in the, in the process. Uh, the bacteria that break down the compost, as I said before, are aerobic. They need oxygen to do their job. So uh, the way that you add oxygen or make sure that there's enough air in there is to turn the piles. You see somebody doing here is you just turn that pile off to get the oxygen. If you just leave it alone, uh, well, you could leave it alone. I'll show you later on how you do that. But uh, uh, if, you, if you have the wrong material or something like that, the wrong ratio of, of uh, greens and browns, then you know you could get that compaction, low oxygen levels, and that slows down the process. So in order to, to sustain the oxygen in the pile, it's a good idea to turn the pile occasionally, although there are a couple of exceptions to that I'll, I'll move to shortly. Okay, so you want to mix your fine and coarse materials and make sure you have plenty of oxygen. Okay, now temperature. The temperature changes occur naturally. So what that means is that the actual temperature of the pile is going to change. And at each temperature range within the process, there are different bacteria that are working. When you first put together the, the pile, the bacteria and other microorganisms, but especially bacteria, because they're going to be the primary organisms that are going to be breaking down the organic matter. Uh, these are organisms that like temperatures, say, somewhere between um, 40 and 60 degrees. They start the process. Then, once this pile starts to heat up, because as they're working, they're giving off energy, they're giving off heat. As it begins to build up, then another group of organisms take over, that are, can tolerate those temperatures. And they can build up temperatures to 110 degrees or so. And then they perish because of the heat. And another set of microorganisms take over. And those are ones that can tolerate high temperatures as much as 160 degrees, which is pretty darn warm. OK. So ideal temperature for fast composting is between 90 and 140 degrees. And one way that you can determine whether your compost is working is to have a compost uh, thermometer. It's just a, a dial thermometer. It has a long probe. You can stick that into the pile, and uh, you can tell what the temperature is. Now, if you do that, you'll find that the temperature will vary in the pile. It's not going to be the same throughout the pile because of the way you construct the pile, and I'll show you that shortly. But uh, you know, you're going to have different ratio of materials and different organisms working at different parts of the pile at any time. So but basically you stick it in the center of the pile and you want to see what the temperature is. And if it's between uh, 900 and 140, that means the stuff is going to break down fairly quickly. Now, what happens at low temperature? Well, it just means that you got to start looking for a problem because there is a problem there if that temperature doesn't go up. And that could mean that the material is too compact. So there's no, not enough oxygen in there for the organisms to work. And so if they're not working, it's not going to be any heat given off. Also, again, if you have too much water, if the pile is saturated, again, there's no oxygen and it can't be done. And then finally, as we talked about earlier, if the carbon to nitrogen ratio is way off, too much carbon, too much nitrogen, then that is going to uh, slow the process and also will affect the organisms that are in the compost pile breaking it down. So those are the, some of the problems that you, so you want to monitor the temperature as you go along and make sure everything's working. And as you can see here, this is the way that the compost uh, process occurs. You start with your compost pile, you have the initial phase, you have temperatures, as you said, oh, this is centigrade, let's convert this to, to Fahrenheit. So you have a temperature as low as 50 degrees, and you can start to get some breakdown in there. And that will go up to uh, uh, up to about uh, 
you know, 70, 80 degrees or so. And then another, and this is what we uh, call the initiation phase, because there's a certain set of bacteria that will start off at that, uh, at that uh, temperature. And then as the food heats up, another set of organisms take over. They're called thermophilic. These are bacteria that they can tolerate these temperatures. And if you get the temperature up high enough, if you get the temperature up around 160 degrees, that will kill any diseased organisms that are in this in the compost pile. And this is one way that you can, you know, I usually tell people do not put diseased plant material into your compost pile. And I say that as a caution because if they don't get the compost pile working right, then that disease organism will simply persist. And if they put it back into the garden, the disease organisms are going to be there and they will infect the, uh, the plant material. Because a lot of plant diseases get onto plants. Probably, you know, some of it is blown in, the spores are blown about. But a lot of diseases, say something like early blight on tomatoes, the disease gets on the plants by water rainfall splashing the organisms, disease organisms onto the leaves. Because you'll notice a lot of diseases, especially something like tomatoes, start at the bottom and then they work their way up. And that tells you that a lot of those diseases are coming from the soil. And if you are adding compost to your garden soils that haven't been uh, composted with high enough temperatures, then and you have been adding disease plant materials to the compost, then you're running the risk of increasing the infection and stuff. So ideally, you want to try to get that temperature up to 160 degrees, and you can get it as high as 170 degrees. Interestingly, what happens at that temperature too? The same bacteria that have uh, caused that increase in temperature actually are killed by the high temperature. But then another, so that stops that process, and then the compost pile starts to cool down because the composting process is finished. And then you get another set of bacteria that, that, that will come in. And these are all beneficial bacteria. And this is what we call the maturation phase. And um, so as the temperature cools down. But the interesting thing is that each stage along the decomposition process, there are different bacteria that are working. And they each have that temperature requirement in order to do their job. And then ultimately, what you wind up is that. Now, how do you make a compost pile? Well, this is kind of an ideal uh, picture here. It's often referred to as lasagna layering or lasagna composting. Because what you do is you have alternating layers of browns and green materials. And that's the way you build your compost. And you usually want to start off with something that is, well, it says here, stalking material. You want to start off with something that is coarse. Now, you can, you can use wood chips here. You can use chopped up corn stalks, something like that, because you want to get some oxygen coming up from, from below. And then your next, on top of that, <clears throat> then you put your brown layer. And as I said, this could be all those things I talked about. It could be sawdust, it could be chopped leaves, it could be a dry brown. Uh, cookies. And then your green layer. All of a sudden, you have your kitchen waste, uh, your grass clippings, your green uh, grass clippings, things of that sort. And then you just alternate these layers. And usually, you want to build up about four to six inches in each layer. Now, one of the things you'll notice in this particular slide is the green layer is in the center of the, uh, the pile. And the browns are also layered, but they are on the outside. And one of the things that does is it insulates the pile too. So you're not losing all of the heat. Some of it helps to retain the heat. So this is a good way to build a, a uh, compost pile. And I'll show you what, what I do shortly. Okay. Uh, so um, that's a very simple way of building the compost pile. Just keep that in mind. You're alternating layers of brown and green. And you want to insulate the whole thing with your brown materials. Okay, now, um, how big should the pile be? And that can be important too. If the pile is too small, then uh, it'll be too cold around the pile. Uh, um, it's just not going to work. So you need a pile that preferably is 
at least three feet wide and at least three feet tall. And uh, you know, you can see piles that are much, much larger than that. You see commercial composters. Uh, they're selling their, their compost. And uh, you see these massive piles, and then they use the big funnel motors to to uh, turn it to get the oxygen in there. But for a home garden, um, this this would work out fine. Something that's about three feet wide, which is about that, and about that high. Okay. All right, and that's what it looks like. Something like that. You can see all that the brown material on the outside. So that's a typical compost pile. You notice there's no structure here, it's just a pile. So that works, but you will have to, to turn that pile. Okay, here are some of the kinds of things that uh, I use to, to build compost piles. You can just take some boards and hammer them together and create a, a, a bay that you see here. The important thing is you'll notice that they're not. Uh, the boards are not right on top of one another because you need to get that oxygen uh, in there. Uh, here's another example uh, where they use old pallets and a lot of a lot of lumber companies and uh, other companies, for example, they get a lot of their goods in on pallets. And then they just stack the pallets up, hoping somebody will take them, I guess. Um, but that's a good way to get the, get the pallets is uh, just kind of look around go to some of the stores and uh, lots of times they're just trying to get rid of these things. And all you have to do is just kind of nail them together and uh, create your, your pile. And then you can spend a lot of money and get a manufactured compost bin. And just recently, I saw an ad for a compost bin that I, I didn't read the whole thing through, but I guess it's an electric thing that actually adds heat to the pile. And but it's, these things are fairly expensive. And composting, as I said, compost happens. It's a natural process. And to spend hundreds of dollars to buy a bin uh, when you could <laughs> don't have to spend anything to do it. So, but anyway, uh, these are called holding units. And simply you put the stuff in there, and uh, then you have to kind of turn it a little bit or stir it around. You can just take a garden fork and kind of stir it around if you need to. Then you also have, oh, this is this is what I do. And uh, the way I get oxygen into my compost pile. It's one of the several ways that I compost. This is simply a wire cylinder. So this is like a holding bin too. It's simply a wire cylinder. This is a one by two inch mesh wire. And I simply cut the wire so that I can create a cylinder that's about three feet wide. And it's a little bit taller than three feet. Now, you see this structure here? That's just old drain pipe that I found. It's plastic. And uh, so I was going to take it to the transfer station. And then I thought, yeah, you know, I could use this in my composting process. So what I did was I drilled holes on all four sides. And I staggered the hole. And this is the way uh, I can get some oxygen into the center of the pile. So as I put in my compost materials in there, this uh, the drain pipe there with holes in is in the middle. And interestingly, I can put my finger in the top here, my hand in the top, and you can feel the heat coming up from the pile. And that tells me it's working. But the important thing here is uh, there's nothing in this pipe. So oxygen is coming out, and the oxygen is getting to the core of the pile, which is usually the most difficult place to get oxygen is into the core of the pile. And so that works pretty well. First, you have the, the uh, fence here, so that allows some oxygen coming from the side as well. Now, the important thing here, too, this is one reason why you want to kind of keep the brown materials on the outside, is because of the nature of the screen here, if you're a lot of the uh, kinds of things that come out of the, uh, the kitchen, you know, the fumes and stuff like that, uh, you know, they would ooze out from the side. But if you put your browns on the outside, that uh, keeps that from happening. I was just wondering if this method has uh, helped you speed up the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because there's more oxygen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Very good point. So it does speed up. The question was, does it speed up the process? And indeed, it does speed up the uh, decomposition process. OK. And then besides the bin approach, you have a compost with turning units. And again, look at this thing. 
I know I've seen people that uh, have these kinds of things. They're fairly expensive. I got one as a freebie one time. It was all plastic, and because I belong to the Garden Writers Association and companies that are trying to push their products, they send you, uh, they send out samples to certain people. And, and I happened to get this compost bin, plastic one, crank and all. Within a year and a half, it all fell apart. <laughs> and I didn't buy it, fortunately. And it made me realize that some of these things are very expensive. But compost happens. Do you need to spend hundreds of dollars to make it happen? No. Uh, there's a, another, uh, what, what I meant by turning is there's a crank on this. And so you put your materials in there, you just turn the crank, and that mixes the stuff up. And so that keeps the uh, compost inside of it aerated. Now, um, the only problem I have is usually somebody buys one of these. And you can get compost, they tell you in about six to eight weeks with this kind of a device. Now, if you only have one and you want to dispose of your kitchen waste daily, because we, I go to the compost pile at least twice a day, because now we're canning and freezing, and you've got lots of of waste materials coming uh, from your, your garden produce. And so I have to go out there at least twice a day to add this to my compost pile. Now, if you want six to eight week compost in six to eight weeks, that means once the thing is filled, then you have to wait until it's completely broken down. You can't just keep adding because after six to eight weeks, if you added something earlier in the day, it's not broken down. So you need, that's maybe why you see two in that, uh, that picture. Uh, here's another way of doing the turning is you have two bins next to one another. So you put materials in here, after several weeks, you turn the material and dump it into this bin. And then you go back and add new, new materials there. So this is another way of getting oxygen in. The approach that I showed you before with my fence, I don't have to worry about turning because the oxygen is getting to the center. Okay, that's this is called hot compost and all these methods that I've been describing. Uh, in order to, to get this buildup of heat in there, you got to make sure you've got the right moisture level. You got to turn the pile periodically. Uh, you want to uh, uh, you, get, you let it cool down after it builds up and then uh, you have everything you can close. You wait until the temperature drops back down to about 80 to 110 degrees, and then you know you've got material that you can use. As you remember, at the peak of the compost process, temperatures can get up to 150, 160 degrees. Uh, I mentioned already that those temperatures, 160 degrees, will kill any disease organisms that are in there. I don't know if I can get that high a temperature. I haven't really measured that carefully. Uh, so I don't put disease plant materials in there. The other thing that I try not to put into my compost pile is uh, weed seed, anything weeds that have seeds on them. Now, again, if you can get 160, 170 degree temperatures, that will kill weed seeds, but it's it's risky. So I, I don't usually uh, put, I put those on a separate pile uh, from, away from the pile that I want to use uh, for uh, adding back to the garden. Okay, and uh, so you want to uh, mix your materials. You want to have, you know, again, the right proper ratio of, of uh, 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 brown to, to green. That's hot composting. Next, we have cold composting. And this is cold composting. And uh, this is the way that I started composting many years ago. That little boy there is now in uh, college. That was my grandson. He is my grandson. And uh, I, this was my first uh, compost pile many years ago uh, at this particular site. And all I did was I just started dumping everything, all the waste materials here. And I didn't bother turning it. And I just kept adding, adding until I got into the middle of the neighbor's property and then I decided I probably shouldn't go any further. But um, anyway, it's called composting. And I didn't use this material, I just right away. It was after a couple of years that I, started taking the material that I first deposited and then started using. By that time, it had broken down, but it took a couple of years. But the thing is, um, I didn't do any turning. I just kept adding to the end of the farm. Just kept going. All the materials get added to one hand. 
all the materials that the other end are just sitting there. And eventually they do break down. So that's cold composting. It's a slow process. And if you want to do that, that's great. I'm as I've gotten older, I've gotten less patient, and I want a faster uh, breakdown. So that's why I'm using the hot composting method. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Can you do it at any time of the year? Yeah. Any yeah. Yeah. That was one of the advantages of the cold composting. You just you can add stuff up throughout the year, and that's and I still do that. And one way that I do that is uh, I also use trench composting. And what I do here, this is in my vegetable garden. And uh, what I do is after, usually after I harvest the peas, because that's one of the first crops that come, comes out of the garden. And so where they were, I start digging a trench that's 12 inches deep, at least 12 inches deep. And this happens to be about 80, 18 inches wide, but it could be as wide as you want. And so what you see in here is all kitchen waste, cabbage leaves, you know, corn shucks, uh, pea shells from shelling the uh, peas. And that goes into, into the trench. And then on top of that, I put a layer of grass clippings. Now the ratio here of brown and green is not very great. I really don't pay too much attention to that. Um, in the, the trench composting, but still, ideally, you should pay attention to that. Now, one of the things I do, I mentioned the corn stalks. I can put in whole corn stalks in this trench. And then I only fill it up halfway, or at least up to six inches from the soil surface. And then this soil goes back on top of that. So, uh, and interestingly, it all breaks down, but even with that six inch layer of soil on top, if it isn't fully broken down, I still have enough soil in there that I can make furrows for planting whatever crops I want to plant. And I've been doing that and I've had absolutely no problem. And actually you can see some amazing results that plants that were planted, crops that were planted where I doing, was doing the trench composting actually did extremely well. So this is another, a very simple way of composting is uh, you have a vegetable garden, for example. Uh, I suppose you could also do this in an annual flower bed too. Why not? Uh, you know, your annual flower garden, your flowers are only there for, uh, for the growing season and then the frost, they die back. And so that space, you can dig the trench and you can just keep adding material to it and do the same thing. So that works out very nice. That's called trench composting. And then uh, we have vermicomposting. And uh, this you have to be careful with, especially nowadays, because there is a worm out there that is causing havoc. Vermicomposting is basically a bin of some sort. You see here a wooden bin. Uh, lots of times you see people will take, and you can buy bins too. I know uh, lots of times for demonstration purposes, a lot of schools will have a vermicomposting operation right in the classroom. What you need for that is, uh, to, for vermicomposting is, uh, you need to have, make sure there's some air. So if you're using something like, uh, say a storage bin, a plastic storage bin, you need to drill holes in it, preferably in a barn for drainage, but also for oxygen uh, to get in there. Now what vermicomposting is, you put your materials into the bin and then you add worms. But you have to be careful what you're adding, especially in this day and age, because of this invasive worm that is just taking over, uh, particularly in this area. There's just literally billions of these worms around here right now. Uh, the worms that are typically used for, in vermicomposting in are what's called red worms or red wiggling worms. Uh, you could use other worms. But you really have to be very careful. These worms, these red worms, are specifically sold for vermicomposting. And they can be expensive. So I'm not big on this, but uh, you know, it does demonstrate the composting process. So what happens here is the worms are consuming the organic matter. And then they're giving off their poo, which we refer to as worm castings. And so eventually you're all of this material. Will be broken down or part of it will be broken down. What you can do is 
and this is broken as it allows something broken down, you can push it to one side of your bin and then put your fresh materials here. And the earthworms will leave this area and go in to get the, uh, the fresh material that you've added there. So that's vermicomposting. Now, what I keep referring to uh, is you have to be careful about what worms you put in there. These Asian jumping worms, which are creating havoc. Now, they're doing what worms do. They're eating organic matter and they're giving off worm parsnips. The problem is that these worms in natural systems, like in a forest, are consuming the top organic layers, which are disrupting the regeneration process of the trees and also creating an environment that is difficult for our native plants to, to grow in. And as a result, a lot of invasive plants are moving into those areas. Are they animalids? Are they like earthworms? Are they the same? They're not the, they're not the same uh, genus, okay. but they are the same, you know, they are in that uh, yeah. that category, that family of critters. And are they easy enough to identify when you see them? Yeah, they are easy enough to identify uh, these Asian jumping worms, sometimes called crazy worms, sometimes called snake worms, because when you, when you pick them up, uh, first of all, they're larger than even our European earthworms and huh. night crawlers. Uh, some of them can be very large, it can be as much as eight inches long. And you pick them up, they wiggle like crazy, and that's where they get the term crazy worm or snake worm. Uh, and the easiest way to tell the difference between them and the earthworms that we're familiar with is uh, behind the head of the, the front end of the worm, there is a, a cylindrical uh, material, uh, it's lighter in color than the rest of the skin of the earthworm. And in the Asian jumping worms, this is called a propeller. This is where the seed, or excuse me, the, uh, the, uh, the eggs are produced in the propeller. And the, this is what the snake, uh, excuse me, the uh, worm releases into the soil. And then the, these, uh, the, as a cocoon, and then these eventually hatch out in the following spring. So what happens with, or uh, one way to tell the difference between these worms is, and that the propellum forms a complete circle around the body of the worm and is close to the head. Whereas with the worms that we're, we grew up with and we used for fishing, those earthworms that we dug out of the soil, is their propellum is more satellite. It doesn't go all the way around. It's satellite and it's slightly raised. And uh, that's the easiest way to tell the difference between uh, the two. Um, there was something else that just took my mind about those. But this is what you have to be careful about in vermicomposting, is you don't want those to get in there because they, they will destroy the organic matter. Uh, or, well, you want them <laughs> to eat this organic matter and leave behind the castings. The problem is they get out in nature and they are raising havoc. And another difference between these, between, uh, these worms there's like three or four different species of this uh, crazy worm. Um, and, and the earthworms that we're familiar with is these are near the surface. And if you just move, for example, some of the leaf litter or wood chips or something like that, they're right there. So they're in the upper layers of soil, like in the top four inches of soil. Whereas the earthworms that we grew up with, we're familiar with, they'll go as deep as six feet into the ground. So that's one of the big differences between these two. So uh, this is why I'm wary of relying on you know, going to the compost. If you can isolate the bin, you know, maybe do it indoors in a garage or something like that, uh, where you can avoid those worms, uh, do that. But it's amazing where these worms, these invasive worms go. I was just moving the pile of stone and they were in the pile of stone, which was above the ground level. So they are getting around. Okay. Now, uh, so what, let's talk about using compost now. Uh, what I do when I'm using compost is I will screen it. If it's, especially if it's not completely broken down. So this is my real bell after I screen the compost. And one reason why I screen it is, well, this I happen to be using for potting material. But uh, I would be less concerned if I was just going to be adding it to my garden soil. But one reason why I screen it, and I use a screen that I simply make out of 
half inch hardware cloth that I've nailed to uh, some two by four posts. And then you just put that over the top of the wheelbarrow, you put your compost in there and you use a hollow rake or something like that and get the uh, finished compost to get fall through. The coarse materials go back under the compost pile. So that's why I do that. So screening compost is, a, is you know, it's not absolutely necessary, but it depends upon what you're gonna be using the compost for. So you can use finished compost as you see here uh, for a lot of different things. Uh, you can use it, you can incorporate it into garden soils. And in that case, I'm not so worried about particles that might be large, so I don't, I don't screen those. What I do is I will put between two and four inches on the surface of the soil and then just work it in to a depth of about six inches. And that's all you really need to do. Um, so that is one way that you can use it. The other thing that you can use it for is a potting mix. And this is where the previous picture that you saw where I screened that. That is because I grow a lot of, even I grow, despite having a large garden, I still like to grow some vegetables in containers. And also I have a lot of house plants. So um, that makes a really good, compost makes an excellent uh, material for making potting soil. And in making a, a potting mix, I'll use the compost, uh, and sand, or some type of gritty material. Lots of times I will, I will use coarse sand, not fine sand. And sometimes I use something like poultry grit uh, as well. And then you can add some soil to that, although lots of times I won't even use that. I'll simply use the compost and a gritty material, and uh, I get a beautiful potting mix and transfer in really well. It would be a good idea to add a little bit of uh, soil to that just to give you uh, a little bit more substance to it. But anyway, that works extremely well, and that's all I use for uh, potting soils nowadays. I don't buy potting soil, I make my own doing this. Now, other things that you can use it for, you can use it to mulch your gardens. You can use it in flower borders, you can use it around trees, you can use it in a vegetable garden, something as a mulch. And in this case, all you're doing is you're applying it to the surface of the soil and just leaving it there. Okay? And again, this is a situation where I don't need to screen it because it is a mulch. And so it's simply apply about a two inch layer not much more than that. If you get a four inch layer of, of uh, compost uh, as a mulch, or any material as a mulch over the soil can actually um, cause some problems. So you need about a two, between two and four inches, maximum four inches as a mulch that works best. But it is an ideal way of kind of controlling weeds and also helping retain soil moisture. And gradually it will work its way into the soil as well, or you can work it into the soil. Now, you can also use it in lawns, the top drips. And uh, what you do here is you just spread it over the lawn area. If you have a thin lawn, for example, and you have some bare spots, uh, just scatter it over the lawn and then put about an inch, no more than about an inch layer, and then just rake it out. And it acts like a fertilizer too because there are a lot of nutrients in, uh, in compost. As it's broken down, all of these nutrients are released. So uh, it's a good way to. Uh, the top dress a lawn if you were, uh, really want to clean up your lawn. Uh, I'm not too fussy about lawns. Uh, mine looks more like a meadow than a lawn, but uh, that's okay. Now, finally, the, the other thing that you can do with it is you can make a fertilizer out of it because it has so much nutrient in it, mineral nutrients. It's got the, the nitrogen in it, it's got the phosphorus, it's got the potassium, it's got the magnesium in it. So you can use it as a fertilizer, which you can use in the garden, you can use it in a house plant, uh, things of that sort. Here's a simple recipe for, for making compost tea. Take a five gallon bucket. You want to shovel just one uh, scoop of uh, your, uh, you know, shovel scoop of your compost. You put it in the bottom of the bucket and then you add water. Just make sure that it is uh, non chlorinated uh, so lots of times, especially in urban areas where you have chlorinated water, uh, you don't want to use that. Just put a bucket out, you can use the drain pipe and collect the rainwater and use that. So you fill the bucket the rest of the way with the, with the water. And then you stir it. And you stir it every, every few days, or about every day, 
and uh, then should be set it aside. And after uh, after about a week or two, then you pour it off. You can run it through you know, something like cheesecloth to separate out the particles from the uh, the liquid. And then you've got a beautiful fertilizer. It's got all those nutrients in it. So again, you don't have to go off and buy this stuff. You can simply add, use this as a fertilizer for whatever you need to, to fertilize. Another way of doing this uh, is you can take, instead of putting the uh, soil into the bucket and you know just dumping it into the bucket, uh, you can put it into say something like a, a, a like a nylon stocking, something like that that is porous, and just put it in there and then tie that and put it into the uh, into the bucket and then just leave it as I say for a week or two and that will turn the, the water uh, into a dark hole which tells you then that the materials that you want have leached out of the compost. So that's an excellent way of creating not only your own organic material for your gardens but also creating your own fertilizer for your gardens. With this kind of compost seed, do you have to use it within Day. Is this very specific? Because I know that if you don't use compost either through, um, if you don't use it within about 24 hours or 48 hours, it will go bad. Is that true with this time? I really don't know the answer to that because okay. I haven't had any problems with it. So um, I, I don't know that. Okay, and hopefully you. We'll grow even some uh, put in the compost in your hands. You might be able to grow some plants right in your hands. <laughs> and on that note, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has, uh, either those who are zooming or yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, my question is: Does light affect any of it? Because I've seen there are methods that do it in the dark. There are methods that keep it open to the sun. So does the nature of the light or even presence or absence of light affect your process? It does not affect my process in any way at all. Do you actively measure the temperature in your compost pile? I don't anymore. Uh -huh. um, I just rely on, uh, you know, I, I especially when I compost with the uh, with the fence material and the pipe in the middle, yeah. I will put a a thermometer sometimes, I just did this recently, I'll tie a string to a, a soil thermometer and I just drop it in there. And in the tube. In the tube. Yeah. yeah. And it actually heats the air. Yeah, it heats the air. air. And sometimes as I'm just going out in the garden, I walk past the compost pile, I, I'll put my hand in that, uh, that pipe and I can feel the heat. That's so I know amazing. it's working. I, I, my question is also, I've been doing compost for about 20 years and I do it so informally and I always feel like it works and I love it and I put it in the bed and you know things grow. Yeah, yeah. great. But I know I'm not doing it with the sort of intricate sort of attention to these details that I could or I'm going to try. Um, yeah. But I'm really curious how much you manage your piles in the winter. Because in winter time, I try to go out and get leaves out of this huge pile. You know, I move them from my yard into this huge pile way out back. And I'll try to go and break through the snow and get some of the leaves and alternate from the brown to carbon with the, with, the, with the nitrogen material that I'm dumping into the compost. But, you know, I don't have a lot of it. And I just, it's, I, I'm starting to think, well, maybe I should keep that stuff in a bin right by the compost pile or whatever. But I'm just curious how much you manage this. I do very little management in a way. Okay. You just dump it your snow on top of the compost. Yeah, pile. okay. Good. It's better on top of the compost. Pile. Yeah. Good. And, uh, wow. It's amazing how, you know, I, I hope I didn't make it seem too complicated <laughs> because it really is a simple process. And I said at the very beginning, compost happens. Exactly. You know, it happens in nature. And, you know, you just, you know, these are some of the things, the things I've talked about in here. Uh, you know, just kind of guarantee that you're going to get a really good compost. Yeah. But don't become obsessive about it. Well, you don't have, in my case, I don't obsess at all. I'm just so happy that it works so well. But I really appreciate your thoughts because it really breaks it down. Sort of, you know, if I wanted to do it more carefully, now yeah. I really have a deeper understanding yeah. of what I would try to do. Now, somebody who is, you know, you, you have these businesses out there, they're making compost to sell. Yeah. You know, they have big piles and all. They have to focus on these kinds of things, and but if you really want to get a certain quality of that and you want to get it quick, then you delve into all of these kinds of things. Yeah. 
but you can get compost if you're just patient and you mix the, the important thing is mix the greens and the browns and uh, you will and make sure that pile is moist we're in a drop period well it certainly wasn't this year but uh, you know uh, then you may have to water it occasionally I rarely have to do that in the climate that we have even though we, last year uh, it was fairly a uh, fairly dry year compared to this year I think they're like eight inches more rain for the year than we had last year. Um, but occasionally there, you know, you, you, you can just, you know, if you're out there in the garden with a hose or you got your water pan or something, you just pour it on. And uh, now with that tube in the middle, I can just pour it down the tube. So that works out nicely. But, uh, you know, the important thing is, this is one way of dealing with a major worldwide problem, and that's getting rid of waste materials. You know, why, why are we sending to the landfill kitchen scraps? There's no reason for that. Crazy. You, can, you, know, you can compost uh, very easily. You can even compost in your house. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Well, and you know, just one quick way, because it's so fascinating. So I didn't realize you could get the temperature up that high. Yeah. 160 yeah. degrees for a row. And China compost. Huh, what? The temperature. I think it depends on how big the pot is. Right. Yeah, well, we have China, China, traditionally, the most intensive agriculture was around cities in these concentric rings, and they used human waste, night soil. But people didn't get sick from that because they knew how to compost that material to the extent yeah. that the harmful bacteria was killed. And yeah. they didn't necessarily know why, uh, in terms of you know that the details of the mic of the um, you know microbes, but they yeah. knew what yeah. worked and what would. Yeah, if you can get the temperatures yeah, yeah, exactly. If you get the temperatures that hot. Interesting. I first learned about that many, many years ago when I was down in Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, and going on a tour there, just walking around, and some of the things describing what was going on, and they talked exactly about that, how they would use human waste and compost it and use it in their gardens. That's interesting. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not about to get into that. I'll still, <laughs> yeah. I'll still no, rely on that in the woods or something. Yeah, like I'll still yeah, rely on my separate tank to handle that. So, yeah. Yeah. Just have one quick question from the from our visitors on Zoom. Does hot composting compost raw material faster? Uh, yeah, hot composting is much faster than cold composting. Okay, great. Yeah. So thanks for that question from the Zoom. I think um, we're, we're coming up on six o'clock, so I'm going to wrap it up here. I'll come uh, thanks so much, Ron. This is really great, really informative, and we've learned a lot. And uh, if you want to stick around and ask some more questions of Ron, I'm sure he's willing to stay around for another few minutes. But thank you for being here for the preview event for Think Food. I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. I'm Marianne Tevin, the director of the Center for Food Studies. So we have our Think Food conference going on tomorrow. Hope to see most of you there. And those of you on Zoom, hope you're coming back. So thank you again, thank Ron. You. So anyway, if you have more questions you want to ask, please. And thank you so much for your checking yes, out. Yes, thank you. Goodbye, all. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you for coming. Good to see you. We do have a question in the chat. Oh, maybe we can. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was nice you. meeting you. I'm, I'm Sasha, by the way. Oh, Sasha? No. I'm going to start. Yeah, I mean, we're going to get the questions out there tomorrow. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we hope to be here tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ron, we have a question from Janine, yeah. who's new to composting, wanted to know what your thoughts on compost starters. Your thoughts on compost, compost starters. starters. Um, I'm not very familiar with compost starters. I assume that these are materials that probably have uh, fertilizers in them, some nutrients uh, to get the things going, and uh, possibly some, uh, maybe some. I don't know, maybe some bacteria in them. Or did, um, I, I really don't know. I'm not familiar with them. I've never looked into that. You know, I just dive into the compost and <laughs> I go shopping for bins or anything of that right, sort. You just use yeah. what you have. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all on Zoom for coming and hope to see you for the events tomorrow. Thank you again, Ron. It was wonderful. Oh, I learned you. a lot. And you've been doing this for oh, ages. many, many years. <laughs>